Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jasmine Scott, and I'm the program manager for Langston. And I'm so happy to be sitting here in our beautiful theater at the historic Langston Hughes Performing Arts Institute. Langston is a nonprofit organization based in Seattle, Washington, and we guide generative programs and community partnerships that center Black art, artists, and audiences, and honor the ongoing legacy of Seattle's Black Central District. We support a variety of enriching programs across multiple disciplines that advance our community through Black arts and culture. Uh, our vision is to cultivate Black brilliance. Today is Giving Tuesday, and we're also kicking off our first ever end of the year fundraising campaign. We have a goal of raising $200,000 by December 31st to support individual black artists in 2021 and to continue advancing our institutional growth. You can find more about our campaign and about Langston by visiting our website at langstonseattle.org. So tonight we are pleased to celebrate the launch of our very good friend, Ijoma Oluwo's new book, Mediocre, The Dangerous Legacy of White Male America. Joining Ijoma this evening is two-time World Cup champion and social activist, Megan Rapino, for what we can all expect will be a very interesting conversation about the dangerous legacy of white male supremacy. Following their conversation, we'll have some time for some questions from you all. So please be sure to send your questions in so we can get some of those answered this evening. So now please welcome New York Times best-selling author, feminist humanist, and Harvard, Harvard Humanist Award winner, Ijoma Oluo, and two-time World Cup champion, co-captain of the US Women's National Team, author and social justice advocate, Megan Rapino. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. I'm so excited about this. Oh my gosh, of course. What an honor. So I know we don't really have anything planned out for this discussion. Uh, one thing that makes me happy, so when we were talking about book tour, um, I hate travel, and my lovely agent was like, Joma, you can do whatever you want. It's the internet. It, and she's like, you don't even have to talk about your book. So I will talk about it if asked, because right. I like my book. I'm very proud of it. But also, I get to talk to people that I was like, who, am I, who would I love to talk to? Who would I love to ask, you know, whose brain would I love to pick? Who would I love to be in a room in? And it was, it was actually really lucky because you DM'd me about your book right as I had just asked my agent to email you mm -hmm. about a talk. And I was like, oh, well, while the you're internet. here. <laughs> the internets do their thing, <laughs> undefeated always. So I'm gonna ask, how are you? Which is a horrible question to ask in 2020. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's still, there are answers to that question. How am I? Um, at the moment, good. I'm, I'm back in Seattle. Um, I was telling you before, we were out on the East Coast um, for a long time. So we kind of got stuck out there early in the pandemic, um, you know, went basically into the summer. Sue did her WNBA bubble um, in Florida. So I spent the hottest months in Florida, which was terrible, to be honest. Like indoors, probably. I mean, indoors, but like you got, you know, the only thing you can really do is the pool, but you got to go outside to get to the pool. And I'm just really not cut out for the heat. I'm Seattle is really kind of my vibe, like very, very chill. Um, but we're back in Seattle. It feels really good. So that's nice. Um, good in a lot of ways. And this year has been horrible and also sort of necessary in a lot of ways. So I, I feel thankful for my health and, um, you know, being able to ride out the pandemic um, much better than a lot of people. But it's been a very thought thought provoking year and sort of gut wrenching year, but I think in a, in a good way. So I'm, I'm thankful for this year, frankly. Yeah. I think that, I mean, yeah, I think a lot of us are in this space right now, right? Where this has been a horrible year and so much has been lost and so many horrible things have happened. And then also part of healing is finding, okay, what, what have I learned this year? What can I take with me? What can change? Cause something has to change, right? I think, mm. I think the, 
if nothing changes after the end of 2020, mm. it will, that will be the greatest tragedy that we yeah. saw it was laid bare, all of the issues, we, the systemic and social issues that we have, and we did nothing to change, you know, um, that would be heartbreaking. And so I'm trying to find where like, okay, where has this been? Where has this illuminated useful things? Where has this, you know, and so it's showing me community, right? It's showing me where community stands and where it doesn't. It's showing me where our systems are failing more than ever. And it's mm -hmm. also highlighting some, you know, emergencies, I think on the horizon, looking at the housing issue that, you know, we've been talking about for years is going to be, you know, I'm still terrified of what's going to happen when these rent moratoriums cease, especially to like black and brown communities. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, I think when I'm giving talks um, like at businesses and they're saying, we can't change the way we do everything. I'm like, you're going to say that in 2020. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm you're like, try yes, to you tell can. <laughs> you can. First of all, yes, you can. And yes, you will. <laughs> because, you know, like you, you didn't know what the internet was until the beginning of this year. And now all your employees work from home and like, mm -hmm. you can absolutely change things. And so what are you looking for? What do you think are like some of the opportunities that you see maybe that we could be picking up from this and taking forward? I think that you said it, there, there's so many things that were laid bare, I think because of the pandemic first, and then because of, you know, the horrible murder that we all saw of George Floyd and Maude Arbery and Brown Taylor and so many more. I just think like, we've just been sold this bill of goods that's just lies. Like we can't afford it. Mm -hmm. We can't afford, all of a sudden we found $2 trillion for the stimulus. Like we don't want to do that every year, but we're not going to need to do that every year. We have money for healthcare. We have money for more stimulus. You know, we, we have it and we've just sort of been told and, and kind of accepted what we've been told that this is just like kind of the way it is. And we're going to like, you know, have some incremental changes here and there, but we really can't do anything major. Mm -hmm. And like, why not? The, you know, the whole world, ground to a halt, not really because anybody wanted to, but just because, and then people just adapted mm -hmm. and we had to make changes. And so we did, and we wanted to make changes in certain areas. And so we did. And I hope this year, I think because it was sort of an onslaught of insanity this year, frankly, I mean, even before the pandemic, we forget like the impeachment hearings and like what was happening in Iran and all these crazy things. I think the onslaught has not allowed people to just get over it. And so they're like finally being forced to sit down. And I hope people take this as an opportunity that to see that we don't have to live this way. Like we don't have to live with the homelessness and houselessness and, and housing insecurity that we have. We don't have to live with the healthcare system that we have. We don't have to be one of the richest, most prosperous countries in the world and ever and like live this way where we're so divided and we have so much inequality that's gotten so much worse throughout the pandemic and is only going to get worse as this continues to fall out and so i i hope people see that a a better life is possible and it's really just our choice of whether we want to do that it's all these decisions are made by people generally or for the most part that we vote into power like we don't have to live like this and that it's our responsibility individually mm -hmm. and as a collective society to take care of one another and i think it's so interesting in america we want to be seen as this like individualistic i can do it on my own sort of you know society and we're just like crumbling right before our very mm -hmm. eyes so we need to like ditch that and you know, make caring about each other cool and something that is like a priority for all of us. Because I think we've seen, like, if one person isn't good, we're all not good. And we're seeing, you know, COVID rage through the entire country and in smaller communities now. It's not just in the cities. So I, I just hope this is like a wake up call to people like, oh, what, you know, the F are we doing? Mm -hmm. We do, we like, we don't have to live this way. Mm -hmm. I hope so too. Yeah. I, I mean, so. and I think a lot of this, you know, when I was writing, when I was writing mediocre, a lot of what I was trying to focus on was, you know, this idea of 
the white man striking out alone and he's a, his own hero in this mythology that also allows white men to never look at what they do collectively and to never have to examine their actual motives and their actual identity mm -hmm. um, and the way in which their identity is tied to the oppression and subjugation of others and also to never investigate what it costs, what it costs them, what it costs everyone else. And, you know, it was so interesting because, you know, I started writing this, had no idea there was going to be a pandemic. When I started writing this, I wasn't even sure how the reelection campaigns were going to be. We had like 20 candidates in the field at the time, you know. And as I was writing and editing, all these things happened, right? 2020 happened. We got down. We knew Joe Biden was going to be the other nominee. And there was a lot of questions people were asking of, are you going to go back and revise it? Are you going to go back and add it in? And, you know, I read through the book and I was like, okay, you know, looking at this line of history, because that's kind of what I wanted to show. And it kind of just pointed to where we were. So I was like, ah, you know, I think we're good. Yeah. Like, I don't even, I think. Seems about right. <laughs> yeah. Like, this is, this is about where, you know, like, yeah, the pandemic threw me for a loop a little bit, but I'm sure if I knew more about science, I would be like, yeah, okay, that fits right in it. The response didn't, you know, the, our absolute failure, the, the, you know, in, the inadequacy, the inadequacy of our leadership right. um, and the way in which, you know, once again, we would cling and, and you know, this, this white male driven society would cling to the idea that we don't care for each other, that it's, you know, all about seeming strong, even if it costs you your very life. Shocking, um, shocking. Is like, yeah, okay, this is another final form that I didn't know quite existed of yeah. this like yeah. you're like this still tracks <laughs> yeah it's still, tracks. This still slaps <laughs> yeah. even harder yeah. like all right well i'll just leave it there it, it's it's been surreal you know um to write and to look at and say oh yeah okay i'm not like you, it's weird to be in a state where you're appalled and not surprised at the same time like it, it feels like every new cycle like oh that's appalling and also okay what what you would expect and mm -hmm. I would love for there to be more pleasant surprises, but I think part of it does tie into what you're saying where not only do we have to start thinking more collectively, right? And I think that part of like, as you know, a black woman, as a Nigerian American, for me, it's about resisting the white male normative idea of everything you rise and fall on your own mm -hmm. and leaning into like my ancestral and you know, communal nature that is in the black community, that's in the Nigerian community. And then, you know, hoping also that other people will borrow that too and realize like, maybe, you know, this isn't in our nature and it, it's not, you know, I think as a species, it's not in our nature. I don't even think it's in white male nature. I think that's, it's a conditioning because as a species, we would have probably likely been extinct had we not learned how to cooperate. I mean, that's one of the defining features of the human race. And so to see, you know, this, these, behavior patterns that are so immediately and easily seem to be harmful um, can persist simply because all they do is make you feel a little better when you look in the mirror at night and you can feel like you're more powerful than someone else. I, you know, I still wonder even after writing the book what it will take to get people to shake that. I, I wonder too, I, I think a lot about not just the sort of mediocrity that we allow and that we celebrate in our country, but like for white people specifically, like what is it going to take? And, and what about this society? Do you just, you're just like, yeah, we're good. Because it's really not good for anyone except like maybe five people. Like, I guess if mm -hmm. you're like Jeff Bezos or right. something, whatever cool but eventually like the whole world's gonna be extinct so like what are we talking about you know mm -hmm. he's relatively young in 50 years like the world's gonna be on fire even more than it is i don't know maybe he'll be on mars who knows <clears throat> but with the exception of it's just uber rich people that are out of reality you know the 99.9 percent .9 of the rest of us i wonder like is it just that as a white person, and, and I think the further, you know, into the sort of supremacy you get, the closer you get to the proximity of power of the white male. So if you're a white man, that's the, the sort of epicenter of it. Like, is it just that you have to wholesale just 
understand and accept that what you've been told about America and yourself and everything is just a lie because like it is a lie and it's like we know that and it's like poor white people are being harmed by the system of white supremacy mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. obviously not to the degree and in the same way and in no way should they be compared but like the system really isn't working for anyone because it's designed for literally one person and it's so interesting how in our country we are just obsessed with this idea of individualism and exactly what you wrote in your book, the sort of I'm gonna, you know, bootstraps, pull myself up, be my own person. And yet, like nobody fits into that. Mm -hmm. Nobody can actually be that. And so everyone is just left with this feeling of either you don't belong or you weren't successful enough or you didn't do it right or you're angry or now someone's trying to take something and it's like, it has to be totally flipped on its mm -hmm. head. Like we are communal people and like we do need our communities and our families and we do rely on each other. And I think the pandemic has, you know, exposed that completely. What I was saying before, just it, it's like, if someone is sick and they're around you, you're sick too. Mm -hmm. And that's just, you can take sick and use that as, as any example in our country. But I'm just wondering why people are clinging I mean, maybe it's just that they can't sort of imagine a new world mm -hmm. outside of that. But that's what I see it as. You would just rather sort of believe the lie than like learn a new thing and mm -hmm. just accept the history that we have. And it's not like everything the country's done has been horrible, obviously, but a lot of it has. And sort of our, our like foundation is not what we mm -hmm. think it is, but it, it can be better. And that, that's what I feel like where I find hope is that it can be better and we can do something about it every day to make it better for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's shocking to me sometimes the mental gymnastics. Like I, mm. you know, if there's, I feel like you can't be a black person growing up in Seattle and not understand whiteness on like a deep level in some ways more than many white people do because mm -hmm. it's how you survive, right? You have to be so observant. Um, you know, I think even like as a queer person, like I, I feel the same way about straightness too, right? Like you mm -hmm. have to know what the rules are. Yeah. You have to know how people are going to react to you. And in a place like Seattle where you're so outnumbered, it's just so, you have to pay attention. But the one thing I can't guess is how it would feel is to be like a grown ass adult and realize the system's unfair. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what that yeah. would mean like if mm -hmm. you've dedicated your whole life to it, if you've screwed over your friends and neighbors for it, yeah. like what it would be yeah. like to be like, oh, you're 45 and guess what? You were never gonna get that promotion. You, it was never gonna work out. You were never gonna feel like a success. I don't know what that would feel like because as a black woman, like that was never promised to me. You know, as a mm -hmm. small child, it was always known that things were never going to work out you know, for me, just because I was talented, just because I worked hard, there were always going to be these elements I was going to have to battle. And I don't know what that would feel like, that sort of betrayal after you've dedicated your life to, to this myth, because that myth was never offered to me. But for you, I noticed like, okay, you are a white person, which I don't, you know, I'm sure people have figured this out. Surprise. Yeah. Um, I'm white. <laughs> when we met, um, this was, I think, 2016 or mm -hmm. like right after you had started yep. kneeling. And I would love to know because you are a white person who decided to do something. And, you know, you were, I believe, the first non-black athlete, the first white athlete, mm -hmm. professional athlete to show solidarity in, in that way. Uh, what was the process that brought you there to decide that this was something you were going to do? I think that for me... I think having come out as gay when I was in college, that's like, you know, just a little data point of like, okay, I'm gay, the norm is straight, got it. You know, some people like it, some people don't, fine. But I'm like, okay, I get that. Being a woman, I think getting into the workplace, being on a team who sort of had a constant fight for equal pay and, you know, felt like we were discriminated against in the workplace with our salaries. I'm like, okay, like I, I am, I'm starting to understand in my early twenties, like how discrimination sort of works. I obviously know about racism, but not to the extent that I will learn later in my life. <clears throat> and then 2014, you know, Mike Brown gets 
murdered in the middle of the street and learning more about Ferguson, what was happening in Ferguson, about essentially the for-profit police department that was operating there, all the citations that were being, um, you know, handed down just the, the incessant police presence in only black neighborhoods. Obviously the protests in Ferguson, it's like you, you know, you have to be like under a rock to not see it happening all around you um, in the news every day. So I think that really sparked my like deeper dive into issues around racism and police brutality and like the system of white supremacy. And I think by the time I got to th 2016, I think for me, it's just like, this is obvious. Mm -hmm. Like once you know, you know, five of the facts about American history, you're kind of like, oh yeah, <laughs> duh. You know, we had hundreds of years of slavery and then followed by, you know, another hundred years of essentially slavery and extremely brutal. And then you had Jim Crow, which is again, slavery in another name and extremely brutal. And then we get to today and we still have the same shit happening. So I think for me, it just, and this is honestly where I struggle in people's inaction or their lack of empathy or, or just willingness to do something is like, I didn't create America. I'm only 35. I've only been here this long, but clearly I benefit from it in certain ways. I'm also not benefiting from it in certain ways. I'm a gay woman in a, you know, in a, in a field that doesn't really value women in the sport. So like I can get it a little bit, but I just feel like it's really obvious. And so I don't understand why people take it so personal. Like it's a personal affront to who they are. Like they didn't work hard or whatever. I'm like, we've all been lied to. You don't just like work hard. And then, you know, it, it, that whole thing just drives me nuts. Cause it's like, if you work hard, then you're successful. That's sort of what we're told. Right. Mm -hmm. But success really only means one thing. And that's like making a lot of money. And so then if you don't make a lot of money, then it, essentially it just like negates your whole life. And like, you didn't work hard and you didn't try these things that sort of aside. But I think with the racism, I'm just like, this is really obvious that it's happening. And even, you know, in my sort of brief thought process around to kneel or not to kneel or just, I don't even think I, I weighed it like that. I just saw Colin speaking and it was the first real like action step that I saw. I was like, okay, this is something that I can do. This is like putting an action to everything that I've been learning. This makes sense to me. I think it just, in that moment, it was like, well, this is so obvious. I'm not going to be, you know, I might be the first, but I certainly won't be, you know, one of the only or the last. That obviously didn't really bear out. Um, and I think just the initial reaction, you know, I was, I think, very naive at that point. Just not, you know, I'm, I'm not black and I don't understand what it is like to have that sort of incessant. I think just for a moment to see that kind of, vitriol from people and a true lack of understanding coupled with, you know, whether it's violence off the tongue or actual violence or, you know, words or whatever it is. It was just like, I'm like, did I just like, am I reading something that nobody else is really like, <laughs> did I fucking miss something? Oops, I don't know. I'm not no, it's fine, it's fine. Yeah. I'm like, did I miss something? <laughs> like, did y'all miss something? Like somebody's missing something here that I don't really understand. So for me, it is very matter of fact. And I don't know, maybe I just never clung to like the sort of American dream. I don't think that's how the word world really works at all. Mm -hmm. And so that wasn't like a, a death to me. I, I, the like white guilt thing too. I'm just kind of like, I don't feel guilty. I just understand what my privileges and try to always understand what it is and then try to combat it. That's like, that's all we can do. So I feel like people maybe get overwhelmed or don't know what to do. And so that leads them to inaction, which is just, you know, wild mm -hmm. that people think that's the best idea. But it just seems so obvious to me that this is like all of our problem, white mm -hmm. people's problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it was, I remember like just being really impressed seeing it and then, you know, we talked about it and yeah, you were like right 
in the beginning and like in the middle of being like, yeah, oh, that was like in whole, the thick of it. Whole world is changing right now in a way. And I I remember seeing I'm like, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> so, that like, tracks. <laughs> what do you what do you feel like you kind of wish you, maybe you had known then at the time? And I know you write a lot about this kind of in the book that you didn't get yet, you know, because it's been now four years. Um what you know where it's like oh this would have been useful to understand when we started doing this Mm. um i think just more of like the language and like the nuance and how to to better express what i wanted the outcome to be like i think in the beginning i felt like i knew enough and i could speak to enough to like get through you know press conferences or interviews or whatever it was but I feel like because there was so much you know sort of distraction being thrown all the time I think I got lost in that a little bit it was like the flag and the military and I was like I knew that that wasn't it but I I didn't quite have like the words to bring it back immediately so that part but I think that's just like a, a little bit of the learning Um, and then just more into, you know, the nuance of white supremacy and how it affects people and the long history of it and how, I think the more you learn about it, the, the more you, you can't help, but just like, it's so obvious. And you wrote it in, in the first few pages of your book about it, it working as it's designed to work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the the thing that I've realized and come to understand overall, it's, it's like, it's in everything and everywhere. And so it has to be part of, it's not like something we can like just do. It's, it has to be a part of us Mm -hmm. to like root that out a part of all of us, because we all participate Mm -hmm. in it, Mm -hmm. whether you're the one, you know, getting shit heaped at you or you're the one heaping shit on people. Like it's you're everybody's in it. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, our responsibility to break it down Mm -hmm. I think yeah no I mean that's you know part of what I like I hope that people can see when they're watching this too is you know a lot of what I feel and I write about kind of in the book is that there's this idea there's this pessimism about whiteness that whiteness has um I think that As a black person, right, I am like, I get the way things work and I'm very easy to know how things are gonna turn out. But also we fight and struggle against the system because we know it can change, right? We're not the pessimists in this situation, but there's this deep pessimism in whiteness, the idea and this fear that if we take away the system as it is, everything will just disappear and white people will melt and die and especially white men and and I what I what what I love about the fact that you're still you know continuing to protest and speak out is that you lived through a lot of what white people fear in doing this right and and even what you feared, and I remember you saying this to me at the time, right? What, what happened to you was nothing near what happened to black athletes who protested, but it's still far more than what the average white person who's debating whether or not to, to not laugh at a racist joke is, you know, considering, which is, it's gonna be uncomfortable, you know? But we hear like white people, especially white men, you know, fear of getting canceled and, you know, um, I actually just got a GM today from a white gay man who started with you, you cunt and you're the reason why Trump won and blah, blah, blah. And then it was like, and I'm, you know, I'm sick of being canceled for who I am. And an asshole. Yeah, I know exactly. Yeah. No like, I canceled you. Know. You're just I'm an just asshole. This. It, it was literally like 10 paragraphs and it was like, you know, white men are penalized and demonized for everything. And I was like, look, all you have to do is be better. Like all you had to do, he could have taken half the energy he took to write all of this and could have just wrote and writ, you know, written down Black Lives Matter and would have been great. And then he, it was I mean, funny, totally, a totally pointless aside, but he ended with, I know you probably won't read this, but if there's anyone who would get it, I think it'd be you. Cause I think we both want the same thing here. And like, which which is, which is what i don't know because i read through you know a thing that started with guns like you yeah. why trump won and i'm like 
I, no, I don't. I don't think we want the same thing no, here at all. I think we're on different pages here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know. I don't know what affinity you thought we had by the end of ten paragraphs of calling me names. But the fear of this idea of like we're going to stay where it is because it might get uncomfortable for me mm -hmm. because I might be called out on my actions because I might lose an opportunity stops white people from doing things and they really think they can't handle it and I don't know how to express that you can you can deal <laughs> but like you you're a white person who's you dealt do you can deal with it you can you'll make mistakes and maybe you won't always be gracious in your response but you you can live with it because as like a black woman I have been living with it my whole life and I know that I'm made of the same stuff as other human beings like we can live with it but like do you ever find have you found people like reaching out to you white people like asking or sharing their stories or trying to figure out how to kind of go through the discomfort of doing this work yeah definitely i, I think people are there's different things i think people feel i think with with men and with white men they're just like not used to like being accountable for things because they can kind of just like go through the world and like do whatever. And I don't think people really call them out in the whole cancel culture thing. I'm like, it's not cancel culture, but you get to say whatever you want to say. Everyone has that right. But that doesn't absolve you from any sort of responsibility from what you're saying. <clears throat> and so I think people just want to have this like, you know, long leash where they just like get to say whatever. Meanwhile, you say like white male and everyone's like, oh God, everyone, <laughs> oh my God, everyone's attacking the white males. And it's like, you guys have been making racist, homophobic, crazy ass jokes forever. And like, this is not that funny. Like they're actually not clever, funny, smart jokes. Yeah. And so there is a sense of like accountability that I think people just don't want and they don't want to be called out. It's uncomfortable. They're probably doing it because they're insecure anyways. Mm -hmm. And so then it just sort of gets at that. I think other people genuinely are afraid to be seen as racist and to say the wrong thing and to be like caught out in this moment, especially because it's like, you don't want to be the one that's like, being the racist right now it's like how in the world can you be racist right now how can you say some of those things but people fucking do mm -hmm. and they don't want to do that but for me I'm just always like only you know your thoughts mm -hmm. and only knew you know what you said what you didn't say where you stepped in where you didn't you know what you deem account or like how you hold yourself accountable what you deem acceptable or not and I just feel like people know and I feel like there's this like I don't know this like uh, that's what I always think to myself like can I look at myself in the mirror I know when I did the right thing or not and I think people are like living in their own fear and they just can't sort of get out of it but it's it's hard to to let people know that like you'll be fine mm -hmm. without being sort of patronizing I'm like I, I mean you'll be fine. Like nothing bad is going to happen to you. Even, you know, I wrote it in my book um, about my coach and it's like, I did get death, death threats, but I'm like, I really, really like credible death threats. <laughs> you know, like, I'm just like, there's not a lot of just sort of like random violence against people like me. Mm -hmm. There's just not. So like, be honest with yourself about that and just say it. Like, you're you're getting like whipped up into this total non-reality that makes you feel comfortable because you know you didn't do the right mm -hmm. thing and like only you know that because that's just something and like my coach said she was like afraid of her death threats and I'm like you live in a gated community like mm -hmm. you're rich <laughs> you live in a gated community we travel with security mm -hmm. you're like fine mm -hmm. you're gonna be fine I'm gonna be fine and I don't know. I think again, it's 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 the the like self identity, not wanting to just be honest with yourself about the role that you play, and not wanting to be honest about the history of America, and, and it requires you to give up this identity, which is just really comfortable because it's all we've mm -hmm. ever been told. And I think people just get stuck in that, mm -hmm. and like that sucks because 
it's not hard. I just, I like, I really want people to know that. I want white people to know that. It's not hard. It's really not. It takes, like, a little bit of effort, a little bit of thought, and really, honestly, just sort of doing the right thing. And, like, you'll feel better. Mm -hmm. Like, you'll feel better about yourself because you probably don't feel great about yourself right now. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. I, I honestly, I, I feel like I struggle to answer these questions oftentimes because it seems so easy. Like it's, it, and maybe that's part of it is that we can just go through life. And if we don't want to think about it, we don't have to, because we're not black mm -hmm. and we don't live in black skin and we don't have all of these things that we constantly have to navigate. But like, if you really just think about it for five minutes, like mm -hmm. you're fine. Yeah. And you know, it's funny for me too, is because I don't know if white people get that we see the racism, whether you're going out on a limb or not, like it's there. It's just that we don't, the burden is on our shoulders until you do something that is so blatant that we get to push it off. Right. And I think that a lot of times what white people get subtly and aren't willing to admit is they would rather we carry um, especially white men would rather we carry the burden of their racism and their sexism for sure. And now, you know, and their fear in stepping out and trying to address it is that it will be something so blatant that when we start talking about it, that the whole burden will be lifted off of our shoulders and placed onto theirs, but it still exists. Like we still know we're still navigating it and struggling with it. I guess. So we're just about time for Q and A. And I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask you one more question. Um, because I know that you've spent a lot of time, you've been, you know, really kind of in the center of this fight for pay equity in sports. And I know that, you know, when we talk about white men, we have to talk about white women. And I guess, what it, have there been conversations around the disparity and the ability to fight so hard for pay equity on a gender line, but not talk about racial equity within the sport? Is that something that people are talking about? Is that something you see people ignoring? You know, what, what are your feelings around that? I think we've started to have those conversations. I don't think that we've always had them, certainly not in the past, absolutely not. I think even just like the racial makeup of the team um, is becoming more diverse, but soccer in America and really all over is racist, but soccer in America for sure um, just has so much discrimination. But I, I think through our pay fight, it's like, it's weird because we're fighting from this incredible position of privilege. Like we can call the New York Times if we want to. We can get on TV. We're, you know, athletes in a country that glorifies not only athletes, but winning and dominance and God, Americans love America. And we get to represent America all the time. And so I think through our fight, we've definitely started to realize over the last couple of years, like this is not really for us. Like we should be doing this on a much larger scale and talking about. So when we talk about the pay gap, like pay gap is not 80 cents. That's not what it is. That's not even close to what it is. Like we should start at, you know, 55 where Latinx women are, or black women are, and let's have that just be the baseline. And I think we've done okay at it, but not really. And I think that the Federation obviously has a long ways to go in their stance and just their I think they're just general like undertones of feelings. I'm like, if you were willing to do what you did to me in 2016, like imagine if that was a black player and black players on my team have told me that, like, I would have loved to kneel with you, but like, mm -hmm. what the fuck? I'm not kneeling, you know, mm -hmm. like this is like, of course I wouldn't after, you know, what they did. And so I think just from a, not only from the team's perspective and all of us starting to understand and having more conversations throughout this year, um, you know, the Federation pulling back the, the kneeling ban. But I think just as players, we need to do a better job of centering. And I think the, you know, for the most part, pretty much all of the, the most popular players on the team have always been white. And it's like, we fall into this girl next door, cute, white, like that's a, a non-threatening kind of female athlete that we're okay with. And why is that different than players in the WNBA? Or why is some of our black players don't get the press that some of the white players get? So I think those start, those conversations are, are starting to happen, but have been, frankly, I think, nowhere near where they need to be for the history of the team. Thanks for answering that. And I hope that it 
It will. You know, one thing I always try to like stress to people is when you're stressing a system, when you're asking a system to change, you might as well shoot for the moon. You might as well put change everything it in it, right? If you're yeah. going to be talking about pay equity, you might as well talk about racial equity as well. You might as well, while you're changing these systems and demanding adjustments, bake it in instead of saying, okay, we finished this process. Now we're going to go back to the beginning and start this process here because I think that it never gets to us. Like it never gets to people of color. It never gets to trans women. It never gets mm -hmm. to disabled people. It kind of hits the top level and leaves. So I hope that people it hits recognize. the white women and it stops. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. It hits us and we're like, things are great. Yeah. That, that's really true though. I mean, I, I feel like because white women are usually in the position with the microphone or on the platform, whatever you want to say, it gets to us and we get our shit handled. And then we're like, cool, everyone's good. And that's like, that's why you the intersectionality and you have to have the most marginalized people, the ones that are your leaders. Mm -hmm. Like those have to be your mouthpieces and your leaders because they will in in turn take care of everyone because they are everyone. everyone. Well, that's, that's a wonderful way to think about it. And I hope that people will pick up on this. Um, and now I think it's time for us to go to Q and A. So that question. Yeah. So we have a few questions, some good ones too. So, it looks like this first one's gonna be for you, Ijoma. Um, and it is, how receptive do you think men will be to the conversation generated by your book? And do you have any thoughts on how to form or support these important conversations in ways that will resonate and have any chance of getting men to reflect on this information in anything other than a defensive, hostile way? So to young men. And I don't think I could have written, if I was like, men are beyond hope, <laughs> like then what, what am I doing? I might as well, you know, start writing the murder mysteries that I've been wanting to write because there's no, you know, if I thought like white men in particular were just completely beyond change, if I thought the systems were stuck, but also here's where I am at the same time. Um, this system, there are not enough white men for this system to work on its own, just on their will alone. So I, have hope white men can change and i know some white men are open to start this conversation but if they're not there yet i don't care because we have it within us enough of us uphold the system and contribute to the system that those of us who do know something's wrong or need to know something's wrong who maybe aren't white men can be doing this work but i do know that there are people who are open to it and i i i see that you know i see white men who are saying you've put words to the despair that i couldn't quite put my hand on this feeling I've had that you know things aren't right and I don't know what to call it I don't know what to call this malaise this sadness this, this, this disappointment that I have and it's the fallout right from being told that you will inherit the whole world but your only measure of self-worth is how much power you have over others right that's that's an incredibly that that robs you of empathy and connection with other people it's an incredibly isolating and disappointing and sad way to live and yet the narrative is that's the best way to live. And that, that disparity is something that, that I know white men feel and we're seeing this in suicide rates and violence rates that something is very, very wrong. And so I do think that, there are, there, that that's an option. But I also think that you know, who I think the primary audience is going to be is everyone else, right? People who are maybe raising white men, who love white men, people who are suffering under the heel of white men, you know, who need to, say this is a pattern this isn't one individual bad dude this is a pattern this is about what we value as a society to start having conversations about how to change it so that's really kind of where i focus you know i i absolutely believe in the capacity for anyone to grow and change but i'm going to start a little closer to home you know and maybe do the work there awesome Okay, so I don't know who this next question was necessarily intended for, but I do think it might be a good question for both of you guys. Um, and the question is, can you share a childhood memory that triggered your awareness of discrimination? Do you want to start? I feel like I, I never thought about it until I left and then thought back on my life. I lived in a you know, pretty small town. It's super homogenous. It's very conservative, white, like just, you know, your normal like white town. So clearly there was all, it's like, you know, we were, you know, there was people in 
high school saying the n-word sort of casually or there was you know saying gay or whatever it may be and sort of looking back understanding that there was kind of like one way to be in in high school and even sort of growing up I feel like I look back on I mean even my own process of coming out I should have known when I was like four and when I finally figured it out for myself which was more like an aha moment than anything I was like oh my god this is embarrassing how no one told me like no one thought to tell me my whole life that this was you know painfully obvious but I feel like it wasn't until looking back where I was like okay this is what's happening in my town like this is this is what a homogenous white town looks like and these are the reasons that it's good and bad and the things that sort of need to change and kind of informed my life then moving forward but I don't feel like I had that moment as a kid because I didn't have the language I didn't have the understanding of any of that mm -hmm. yeah I think like there were obviously systems impacting my life as a young person that I didn't quite get but also I was very very aware that I was a black girl in a white space from immediately I was I grew up in you know Linwood in, in the north end and so I was the only black kid in every class I was in, except for third grade, there was one other black kid. And we moved to Sandpoint to the housing projects there for six months. That was it outside until I got to middle school, I was the only black kid in every room I was in. So from you know the age of probably five on, especially I think as a woman, right, your physical appearance is kind of picked apart. And so I, I became aware really quickly that people always had something to say about the color of my skin, the texture of my hair, um, my features. That was the, probably the first, was people asking me why, why I looked the way I did, um, you know, why my hair was the way it was, and try, and try to figure this out, you know, and, and, and then asking my mom why, why these were questions I was being asked. So that was probably where I first became aware of it, was in the questions of kids who were often parroting things that their parents were saying or just asking a lot of questions out of the ignorance of parents who never thought to expose them to other cultures you know or people who didn't look like them here's another question that i think is probably good for both of you guys and it's a good question um, how do you recharge yourself oh. what do you do to recharge self-care um Oh gosh, I just really love being at home and doing nothing. <laughs> it's like we talked a little bit earlier about not traveling for the book. Um, and there is something that you're missing out on, but oh my God, how nice is it to not go anywhere, to be like in your own space? Um, I just really love being at home. I feel like that's where I recharge. I am a very social person I like to go out and do things I thought I was much more of a homebody pre-pandemic and then being home every day I'm like oh there's literally nothing to do I want to go I want to like go and do things and I didn't realize how sort of important that was but I think especially as an athlete that that balance of doing other things and just leaving the sport behind whether that's dinner or just sitting at home and you know being with Sue or just relaxing I feel like that's that's like my happy place mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, you know, I, I um, I've always been kind of a homebody. I mean, for, for someone who's been in the public eye for a while and who spends a lot of time in groups, I'm still very much a homebody. But um, my family has been, you know, I was, I was 20 when I had my son. So my family has been, you know, this sense of home that's like real in a sense that has nothing to do with the building, you know, and so I've been able to recharge with them and of course, and now with my partner as well. Um, but also, I think I've had to really lean into the fact that I am more social than I thought I was, and that I do need community in a way that has to be deliberate. Whereas before, when we were kind of forced, I was always forced into these social situations, it gave me an excuse to say no to really meaningful community time. Mm -hmm. And then the pandemic hit, and I'm writing a book about violent white supremacy, and you know, going through this, and I realized I hadn't cultivated community and luckily the community around me was gracious enough to reach out and start that conversation so I could kind of follow the lead but I had to realize that for me like community care is a practice 
that you have to invest in. And so I'm trying to get better at it. Like I have friends who are experts at it. I'm like, you're so good at thinking about other people and like doing things for friends and texting. And I'm like, I have to be like, oh, you have to text back. You can't just get a text being like thinking about you and be like, thanks. You have to <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, yeah, you feel nice. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, and so I'm trying to learn that because I have learned the value of it and realizing like I need to be putting that back out there. So that's something that I hope will get me through more and, and in a healthier way because I can absolutely say in past years I haven't been healthy about it. Um, I've felt, you know, I've had my family, which helps me get through, but I've also felt very isolated in a room full of people because I haven't, because I thought it just magically happens. You magically have close friends that you never text back, that you never think of, and you forget their birthdays, and that's not how that works. And I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to get better at it. I'm not great at it, so, you know, I know I have some of these incredibly loyal friends who are watching right now, and I'm sorry, I never get better at it. And you have every right to expect me to text you, and I will, I, I, I'm getting there. I'm getting better at it, but I love you. I feel the same. That's good. <laughs> I'm like, yep. Uh, Joma, I think this question is for you. Uh, what's the holiday mashup that you speak for everyone when you say you've been secretly hoping for? The holiday mashup. Holiday mashup. I think this was this something that you mentioned. Like songs? I think so. It says it just what's the holiday mashup that you speak for everyone when you say you've been secretly hoping for? Did you mention? No. Whoop. Yeah. Random question. Well, I was really excited about that gay holiday movie. I heard it sucked. It and sucked. I'm sad. Uh, it was just like, uh, we deserve better. Uh, yeah, I heard it was like uh, leading into like all of the like toxic just tropes all the of bad queer shit. outing. And I was like, man, I was really looking forward to that. I know. I'm like, we can't just like, can we just have a cute holiday gay movie? I know. Can we just have it with some, like, you know, a sex scene or something? Right. That would be lovely. Please. Well, we'll do one more question. And it's a great question for the both of you to wrap this up. And it is, what are you currently reading for fun? What are you reading for fun? Oh, I'm so excited because I've been reading again. So I have like three books on my nightstand right now. One of them is this one, actually, uh, One Night by Nina Pino. And then I've um, been reading um, Sam Irby's latest book, because I had started that before the house fire. It's hilarious, wonderful, amazing. I just finished my sister-in-law Lindy's book, which got me through the election. I tried so hard to read a, a paragraph of it to Gabriel, and I was laughing so hard I couldn't, and I had to just hand it to him. But there's a, there's a whole, there's a little chapter that she does on Honey, I Shrunk the Kids that's the most brilliant chapter I've ever read in my life. Um, and then I just finished reading um, How to Raise a Feminist Son, I think, by Sonora Jaw. Brilliant. And I also am still reading my British murder mysteries. So those are going really well. I'm into this Victoria Speedwell series. Usually I hate the ones with the romance because they're pointless and I just want everyone to be having sex instead of thinking about having sex. That's really annoying. Um, but this one, now they're having sex. So I can, I can go through it uh, pretty well. Um, so that was a lot of fun. You're reading a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I've got uh, Gioma's book on my bed stand so I need to get into that you know I find it's I don't know when to read I don't know when I should be reading and I have a hard time like carving out the time to read. it's like do I do it in the day do I do it at night do I want to watch shows at night you know what's got me back into reading honestly is my partner took a job um he got a a promotion and he's the morning host at KXP he gets up mm -hmm. at three o'clock in the morning so he goes to bed at 8 p.m. Oh. And so that's the time where it's like, I'm not going to be watching a movie because he's asleep. Yeah. And so now that's, I've been reading. So thanks, honey. You've, you've brought my reading game back. Mm. But, um, I talk to Sue about getting another yeah, job. Like, yeah. Get some time. Be like, Sue, could you, could, could you do some, something to make it inconvenient for you to do anything bed. but read? Yeah. That would be, you know, okay. she, she'll do that for you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I have that one and I, uh, um, about a quarter of the way into cast, which is oh, amazing. Isabel Wilkerson. Yeah. I think, um, is amazing and I feel like I'm I'm like reading it so slow because I'm trying to catch every single word and just like tying all the things together 
um, I think it's really incredible how she's she's put it in a different perspective than we've sort of ever thought about before. At least I had. So I'm reading those two. I've I've heard so many great things about that. I really want to read that one. I also just bought Mexican Gothic that I want to read really mm-hmm. well. I'm re- and I just finished Minor Feelings, which is great. Minor as Feelings. Well. But and I read uh, Roxane Gay's book, Hunger, which oh, was yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. I dug that. She was really good in that. So, you read a lot more than I do. That's just true. right now. I didn't read oh, the whole I did not finish a single book for fun. Wow. So now it's like I have this pile of yeah. things that I want to read that I'm making my way through. Wow, until you get to the book. I'm hoping, I hope to, I need a little time. Yeah, some to time. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I can imagine that was a difficult uh, book to just be. Yeah, I'm not writing anything right now. No essays, you. I'm not writing cards. Like, yeah, no one's nothing. doing anything. I, not no happening. text messages. Yeah. So those <laughs> Sorry, text messages are going to have to wait. Well. <laughs> All right, so before I do the final wrap, do you guys have any final things you want to share? Anything you want to say? Any final words, final thoughts? I just want to say thank you for having me here. Um, it really was a serendipitous sort of um, in the DMs on the internets um, thing that we connected. I'm uh, so happy that you wrote this book. I think it is just going to be a vital read. And I think just like why people just like get comfortable with being uncomfortable. You're fine. We've been, we've been comfortable for a long time. Like we can handle some reading and handle a change. Um, so thank you for writing and thank you for having me here it's been uh, a pleasure and it's great to see you again it's great to see you too thank you so much and thank you for just being down to come out here and to do this it's been a wonderful conversation and I really hope that people who haven't picked up your book do I hope that people watch this and I know that we probably have a higher percentage of white people uh, watching this particular event than, than the other ones that I have I know that pretty much every white woman I've dated was in my DMs trying to get tickets to watch this. Um, so while you're here, um, you know, I hope that if you, if you engage with the book that you try to look and see reflections of yourself in this and look at where it's talking about you, not your uncle that you thought you were going to use this to talk to, you know, not your dad, but look at you and look for the reflections of where you can make better choices and see where you've, you know, do that little bit of painful work of seeing where maybe you're like, oh God, that sounds familiar. I did that thing so that you can do something better and different. So, but thank you for your support. Thanks to everyone, because I know y'all bought a copy of a book to watch this. So I really appreciate you. And Langston, I want to finally say one thing about Langston, because this is Giving Tuesday. Um, Some of you are aware that my partner and my manager and I started the Seattle Artist Relief Fund um, a little over seven months ago now to help support Seattle area artists with a concentration on BIPOC artists and disabled and trans and queer artists. What many people don't understand was that we immediately were in over our head and Langston was the first place we thought to turn to They stood up, they have been administering those funds, not taking a penny for themselves this entire time and have helped get over a million dollars out to Seattle area artists. That is beautiful and wonderful and you can absolutely support the the fund on the site that you click through to buy tickets, but it's Giving Tuesday and I would really just love if you could throw some extra dollars to Langston itself. Langston is dedicated to supporting black brilliance in the arts, black excellence in the arts. Um, My son has taken filmmaking classes here. They have so many amazing programs for black people. I first saw my partner on this stage um, 13 years ago. This has been a community staple that has really stood up more than ever during this pandemic for the black community in Seattle. And you know, I really hope you can show some love for this space. Um, That means so much to me and pretty much every black creative in this city. So I really like that's the the closing remark I would have if you have it in you to give a little money Langston's way, please do please know that it's going to one of the best causes. I I feel like you took my script. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much, Ujoma, um, for that plug. Definitely. It really does mean a lot. It's been 
uh, amazing for for Tim and I, uh, and I'm sure Tim especially, um, to be working so closely with you and your team to support the Seattle Artist Relief Fund and for you always advocating for the work that we do. Um, it's just been so vital and so important. So thank you for that. Um, you know, as we are rolling into our first day, ending our first day of our end of the year campaign, um, this has been really special. So I'm so happy that we could do this event today, we could celebrate the launch of your book, the release of your book, and the launch of our end of the year campaign. So thank you so much for that. And thank you both. Thank you, Megan, uh, for you both just being willing to come here and have this conversation in person. You know, we were talking earlier about how good it feels to just have some real human interaction when we're in conversation. Because uh, for the past 10 months or so, so many of our conversations have been through the screen. And that's great. And I'm glad that we've been able to pivot and and do things that way, but it's always nice to come together because uh, the chemistry that you get when you have two people in a room sitting together face to face having a conversation, you just get so much more from that. So thank you both for being available and willing to come out and socially distance and have this amazing conversation. We really appreciate it. Um, and like Ijoma said, you know, most of you did purchase the book uh, when you bought your tickets, but if you didn't, you can get the book at Elliott Bay Book Company and you know buy it for a friend. If you bought it for yourself, then buy Ijoma's book. You can buy Megan's book one life there as well. Elliott Bay Book Company is our presenting partner for this event. And so we definitely want to shout them out. We've partnered with them for several events over the course of this past year. Um, and they have been so supportive and they always make sure to send some percentage back of sales from the events that we partner with back to Langston. So actually your tickets um, are have supported Langston. And so please continue to support us and continue to support Elliott Bay and buy these uh, two ladies books, please. Um, you can learn more about Langston, about our fundraising campaign, about our programs by visiting langstonseattle.org. Um, please sign up for our newsletters. You can subscribe by just scrolling to the bottom of the homepage, type in your information, and then you can get our newsletters and you can stay up to date on everything that we have going on. Uh, I invite you to join us this Thursday. We have another event where we'll be hosting a conversation with some of the cast and crew of the Tony Award winning Broadway musical, Ain't Too Proud, The Life and Times of the Temptations. Um, that'll be another virtual uh, event and we'll have some amazing cast members and crew members from that Broadway musical in conversation with Valerie Curtis Newton from the Hansberry Project. So please join us. It is free. You just need to register and you can find that information on our site as well. So thank you again to Elliot Bay, to Hachette Book Group, to Ijoma, to Megan, uh, to all of the support that we have in this theater that nobody knows what's going on behind us, but our, our technical support, Dom and Michael, thank you guys as well. Um, and on behalf of Langston, I wish you all a very pleasant evening. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>